I'm Sean, uh, CEO and co-founder of Looking Glass. We are a startup based in Brooklyn, right at the tip of Greenpoint, so you all can come out and visit us. And uh, we're chasing the dream of the hologram, this huge dream, the cinema dream of the hologram, where you all are familiar with it. A group of people come around, they can see and interact with three-dimensional content, like this is from Big Hero 6. The main character is creating something in 3D, and the thing that he's creating is actually standing behind him. Um, where a group of people can come together and see and interact with three-dimensional content without having to put anything on their heads. And we're doing this through a technology pathway that actually doesn't involve holography in the technical sense of the word. We use a technology that we developed called light folding volumetric display. And I'm gonna introduce it here today, not necessarily to, not necessarily, to promote what Looking Glass is doing, um, but to say that there is a third space that is connecting two worlds together. You know the first two. So the first two branches of this huge new industry that's developing, that's connecting 3D digital space with the real world, are virtual reality and augmented reality. Virtual reality, like everyone in the audience surely knows, is a lot like, I think of it like scuba diving. You gear up and you leave the real world and you go fully into 3D digital space. And it's marvelous in how immersive it is. What is not marvelous is how isolating it is. Augmented reality, my opinion is, has broader applications into enterprise and outside of gaming, um, but it's still this very high friction experience where with your brand of headgear on, let's say it's the Microsoft HoloLens or whatever Magic Leap is developing in the background, you can see that overlay of 3D content on the real world, but nobody else can see it. So it's not natively social. Volumetric display is the most social of these 3D branches. So here we have a couple people interacting with uh, 3D hearts from a CT scan, creating, oh, excellent switch out. Um, those are my kids uh, in a volumetric display. All of that's real footage, by the way, and you can uh, see it running in the system over there. Um, everyone in this room can come over to the two systems that we have set up, and we will not put anything on your heads, and you will be able to directly see and interact with that 3D content in the volumetric display. So it's one step towards this dream of the hologram in the way I think of the dream of the hologram. Been chasing this dream for a while, just to give you some context. I've uh, been chasing this since I was 15. Um, and uh, if, if anyone is a holography nerd, please come over, um, because there aren't many of you out there. Um, it, my parents got me this book called the Holography Handbook. And it guides a uh, young sprout, like me at 15, in how to make a optical table with one ton of sand. My dad took me to Home Depot to get the one ton of sand, and we bottomed out the minivan, bringing it home up the driveway. And that lets you make an uh, optical rig with some lasers and optics to make the hologram that's really similar to the one that's on the credit card in your pocket. The problem with the technology path of the hologram is it doesn't achieve the dream of a dynamic interactive experience. So even after going through the Media Lab, MIT Media Lab program of holography, was still disappointed with that technology path towards achieving that dream. So started Looking Glass uh, as a way to use a different set of technology, a, a different type of technology called volumetric display to chase that dream. Before we knew how to do it, I'm grabbing something over here. Before we knew how to do it, we wanted to show ourselves and other folks what the potential of this new medium was. So we made a technology called volumetric prints. Um, I'm gonna pass some out here, but we'll hold it up to the camera first. So this is a volumetric print of a frog, and your eyes deceive you. There's no object inside. This is made up of 50 slices of plastic. And there's a little bit of ink on each of those pieces of plastic. Um, it creates a very, very compelling three-dimensional scene inside of things that you might not be able to 3D print, like a cloud or a CT scan of a heart. The one thing it's missing is it can't move. That frog isn't hopping, and I can't snap my fingers and change that into a beating heart or a video of my kids running around inside. So what we've been doing in Looking Glass over the last couple years is trying to figure out how to replace the ink in these volumetric prints with light. I'll pass these around. Um, please make sure they get back to me. 
Uh, we always we usually lose one in a talk. Um, this, this is me, by the way, so uh, don't lose that, or I will have serious serious problems. Um, along the way, we wanted to test the other piece of the dream of the hologram, which is the interactive aspect. So. In Looking Glass, we made the first um, way for groups of people to have identical volumetric displays at a very low resolution to share content um, with each other. So here is an L3D cube, um, 2000, over 2,000, uh, 2,200 of these are out in the wild, um, and they have 512 points of light inside, true 3D space, accelerometer inside, you can interact with it. Um, there's even some neat stuff that uh, lets you whistle and play music and have it interact. People would make programs and a guy in Brazil that had one of these sets could make 3D Tetris and share that with a guy with an additional set in uh, Brooklyn. Um, so standardization in volumetric display. Problem with this system is it only has 512 points of light. Can't really see a person or beating heart with that much resolution. Pass that around. Um, so then the step that I'm here to mainly talk about is combining the, almost the resolution of volumetric prints with the dynamic shareable quality of the uh, L3D cube. Uh, and it resulted in this contraption over here, uh, which we're calling volume. Uh, this is a beta version, obviously not something you would buy at Best Buy, um, but it is the first system in which folks can start to create content in true 3D space where a group of people can see and interact with that. These are actually my kids inside. Um, just to explain how this works, uh, it is distinct from the pseudo holograms that you've seen on the web. Um, the wonderful uh, Pepper's Ghost holograms of Tupac or Michael Jackson or that you'd see at Harry Potter Wizarding World, they're great except they're not true three-dimensional content. Um, this system uses 10 light guides that guide the light from a conventional projector engine, 2 million points of light, up into those 10 light guides, and then they effectively make 10 transparent layers or 10 transparent screens, and we pump information to each of those screens just as, if, just you, just as you do when you take a 3D model and want to 3D print it. We slice it up, but we do it 60 times a second. Um, I'm going to point this towards the folks over there. So you don't feel left out. Um, my colleague Albert in the audience um, will show folks after the, uh, after the show here when everyone's done, a second system. Um, sort of maxes out 100 people view uh, per system. Um, that's Jane and Ben uh, talking to a horse at a farm. Um, just to show how that works, we record that content with, right now, an app, it's available today, um, an app called Holoflix. Uh, it's free, um, it's experimental, we're not selling the volumetric video app, but we want people to start to experiment with um, this new medium that is so primordial and so weird, and we think has so much potential. Anyone that's developing a company in, like this is a company out of San Francisco, Occipital, they make these amazing um, three-dimensional sensors this enabled volumetric video to happen with a little bit of software in the background. This type of camera will be in everybody's pocket very soon. In fact, the iPhone 7 Plus, uh, the, the, the iPhone 7 Plus has it, um, and uh, soon folks will be able to get access to that. Apple hasn't allowed that yet. But this is the future of memories, and you can imagine a little bit further, de further down the line how folks communicate volumetric Skype and things like that. I'm talking five plus years down the road. There are other applications for volumetric display that are coming sooner than volumetric Skype. So anytime you have medical content and you want to show that to a group of people, like patients, uh, without them having to don VR headgear, um, you can see that best in a volumetric display. I'll show you a heart here. So inside this system is a CT scanned heart. Um, 
you can interact with this with touchscreen or with other uh, interactive elements made by other companies uh, like Leap Motion. And so that's directly um, pulled into the system. And if you went around the other side, you could see the spine and so on. So anytime there's MRI, uh, MRI, 4D ultrasound, CT scan, 3D microscopy content, groups of people will be able to see and interact with that in true three-dimensional space. Um, creating in 3D uh, is another big one. I'll show one more demonstration of this technology. Um, this is sort of the magic demo. Um, it does have applications, but a little bit further down the road. So this, was, this demo was actually made by a company uh, called Leap Motion. They make this sensor here. Um, unfortunately, you all won't be able to see it well. I'll, I'll turn it to you in a second. Um, th this is a, a demo that they designed for VR and 2D uh, experiences. And we pulled it into this system through an SDK um, that one of the guys on our team, Des, wrote. Um, and it lets folks interact, oh, actually that's pulled out. It lets folks interact with three-dimensional content very directly. Um, other applications, like this is a drop of water blown up a thousand times. You can imagine that the microscopes of the future will be connected up to something like a volumetric display that either Looking Glass or other companies uh, create. Uh, so that groups of people can experience and interact with that content and consumer applications a little bit further down the road. Um, thank you everybody for having me here tonight and really appreciate uh, anyone that's in a peripheral field, VR or AR, there are a lot of folks on the team who are VR and AR enthusiasts. Uh, we want to basically here tonight to share that this thing even exists, that this field even exists. And uh, we really want to uh, bring anybody into our labs or into conversations that has any ideas about the potential of this new medium. We have our own ideas, but we've only been out of stealth for about three weeks. So it's really a great opportunity, and I feel really honored to be able to share this with you tonight. Thanks. Oh no, my box is not working. Okay, good. Uh, I'll come to you, you've asked a question already. Uh. So, I was wondering, is it possible to take a video, like a video of a family's summer vacation or something, and you have software to turn that into volumetric display? Yeah, uh, great question. There are ways to convert 2D video into 3D, but, um, the tricky thing is you're not increasing the amount of information in that video, so uh, the experience ends up being pretty, uh, pretty weak. Generally, this type of display, or even showing it in VR or AR, that the content that's best displayed and interacted with in these systems is collected or created in 3D. So like that camera and that application I just showed you records 3D content in the world, um, and the cameras that'll be in your pocket soon will as well. Pulling a CAD model in, or things like that, that actually are 3D content, are the best. But there are ways to do that uh, in labs. Have you ever inter interacted with a company called Dimension Technologies, DTI in Rochester, New York? Oh, Rochester, the center of optics in the world. Uh, thank God um, Eastman Kodak went out of business because all, all of these optics guys are out of work. They're looking for cool stuff to do. Um, but uh, haven't interacted with them. What is their product? It's a, a 3D without glasses technology that I've seen about 10 years ago. Okay. That they have had trying and struggling and improving and going back and forth on, and it might be something that I'd like to introduce to you. Possibly. Yeah, I would love to hear Very more about it. Very smart people up there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's the 3DS, which is, the, I think, the most well-known, no glasses, 3D display uh, for a single observer at a single point in space. Um, and it's doing a trick on your eyes. Uh, I don't know how the dimension system works, but the, normally the autostereoscopic 3D systems send two different images to your eyes 
and you have to kind of be in a particular spot to get that sensation. This system and systems like it that Looking Glass doesn't make, but other volumetric display systems, they put light actually in the spot in three-dimensional space where it would be emitted from if it was a real object. That means like a two-year-old that doesn't have binocular vision can see and interact with that just as well as anyone. So this is awesome. Thanks for the Thank presentation. You. Um, where are you taking this? I mean, what's your target for the future in terms of your ultimate product? Sure. Uh, the ultimate goal is to fully achieve the dream of the hologram, um, which is three-dimensional content that eventually you can interact more and more directly with. Uh, I believe that VR and AR experiences will have a big role to play in the future, but won't be the primary way that humans interact with three-dimensional content. Something like what we're doing or maybe what the folks at Dimension are doing that don't require headgear, um, I believe that is the way that most people for most of their time will interact with three-dimensional content in the 21st century. And that's merely because that's sort of what happened with technologies before, you know, the radio or television, not 3D television, um, which required somebody to put on glasses and sit in one spot. And we know how that turned out. Oh. More here. So you touched on, um, so you, you've talked about visionarily like where the content is going. I mean, you're creating like, a, I mean, and you're obviously creating a new medium, by the way, super cool. Um, but you talked about like medical applications, for example. Um, is that where you sort of envision your bulkhead in terms of like where is your first like true like go to market? Like where where do you see this like being first applied and like where like are the most people first experiencing this? Sure. These are actually four of the initial markets that we see um, coming down the pipe before the supervision is achieved. Um, and to be totally honest, we don't know which of those will grab first. Uh, medical, patient-facing medical is a big area of interest um, and we're already starting to do, we're uh, doing a collaboration with 3Scan which uh, creates 3D models for medical data and we're showing that at TEDMED in about a month. Um, so it's very, very, very early days um, but you know, you can, eat, there are things, the reason we're releasing this first as a beta unit then in about a year we'll do a scaled up uh, developer's version is, to be totally honest, we don't fully know what the initial wedge application is for this technology, and I know that's a horribly dangerous thing to say surrounded by uh, anyone with money, um, but that's the truth, and um, a lot of things with a lot of potential in the past have gone down the same path, like movies or the phone. Um, not to say that this necessary, this incarnation will achieve that level of ubiquity. Something like it will. But one last question, Maria. Let's try to keep it sort of quick. Yeah. All right. So I, I agree with you that you're that you don't want to do something that is a head-up display. But is there is there potential for this in a head-up display? Could it work? I know that the focal length is really complicated because I think if you can judge depth better with uh, with a three-dimensional image than you could with just a two-dimensional, then there's applications for companies that are doing head-up displays for motorcycle riding, for example, where you want to see if there's a car coming at you from behind you. Yeah, that's an amazing, amazing question. Uh, about 20 years ago, there was a lot of research put into volumetric heads-up displays because in addition to giving you binocular cues, it would also give you accommodation and convergence, which is like how much your eye squeezes to look at a certain point in space. And um, those were improved systems. The problem is that they were like this big. Um, so I, to my knowledge, nobody has quite figured out a volumetric heads-up display that is small enough to uh, walk around with. Nobody really knows what Magic Leap is working on. Maybe it's a hybrid of several different technologies that can do that, but I, yeah. Thanks. Thank you.